Good, good, good. I uh, want to start off today with, um, I've got a, it is, and, and going to play this, but it, it's all in the answer to the question, what's your favorite Christmas tradition? This is my family's here. Are, are you ready to play it? Go ahead. This is, this is my family's favorite Christmas tradition right here. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. <laughs> but don't you love the bass? Don't you love the bass? I tell you, you know, some of the, I think Ron made the comments, 50 years old. Well, it's for my family, it's almost 40 years ago that my wife and I started the tradition on Christmas morning of playing this song. We wanted to start with something that celebrated Jesus's birthday and gave them a clue when they could come down from upstairs, downstairs. So we would eventually, after a couple of years, have these five little bodies all lined up on the steps, waiting about six o'clock in the morning. Kid you not, you guys understand. As we go with tradition, 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 and I can go through our Christmas morning. And now the best part is all five of my families, my children, do the same song for theirs. It's really cool. No matter what household, they play this song as the tradition gets passed down. So what are your Christmas traditions? What are some things that you very much look forward to for the Christmas season. Go ahead, just a couple of people. What, what is it that you look forward to that it is tradition? And it's interesting while you're thinking about this, we get our children every other year and they go with the other side of the family the other year and they worked it out very well so we get them all together, not two or three here, all together in one year. And let me tell you, don't you blow a tradition. But we've always, we've always done. We've always done. We've always done. We can't get around it. And now they keep adding traditions to the point where Christmas day is so filled. Oh my gosh, we have to go carol. And we have to, I mean, we, I can just run down the list. It is just absolutely wonderful. So what are your Christmas traditions? Really? Gingerbread house. Gingerbread house, yes. Starting today? All right. What about some of the rest of you? What are your traditions? So Your Christmas, the but Christmas Eve has been a tradition for your side of the family. Sonia, And you still use it today, those traditions. But think about it. Think about what traditions you do. And let's talk a little bit about last week, okay? Last week, we talked about the virgin birth, Mary. And I tried to impress upon you as I impressed upon me as I go through and I take a look at all this stuff. And I tried to impress upon you. How do you think Mary would have felt? being a 13, 14 year old girl and all of this happening to her. And as we talked about before, we try and put our own culture on their culture and it's just not the same thing. It was so different being part of a Jewish family because it wasn't just traditions at Christmas with us. Everything was tradition in a Jewish family, everything. 
And now we've got this 14 year old young girl that's pregnant. She's not married. Promises made, promises kept. But can you imagine what it would have been like, the virgin birth? And the point I think Lee Strobel made last week, if you can believe in the virgin birth, if you can get your head wrapped around it, other things start to fall in place. Well, this week, I would like to go and do it in terms of Jesus. What does the virgin birth mean for someone like Jesus? And you go, well, what are you talking about? Why is it important when we talk about Jesus, this virgin birth? Before we go any further, can anyone tell me why the virgin birth is important when we take a look at Jesus? Not Mary. Because of the virgin birth, he was perfect. And we're going to talk about that, Bob. Thank you for bringing that up, because we're going to talk about that, because we can slip into Gnosticism so easily. When we view the virgin birth, we can slip right into Gnosticism, which I've talked about before, Gnosticism and the new atheism. Okay? There's no chance that he has a biological human father. We're going to talk about that too. All right? You go, what do we? He did have one? No, 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 he didn't. <laughs> okay. We're going to do a little bit about that. What else? Fulfills prophecy, which we're going to talk about a lot next week. It fulfills prophecy. But why is it important that he had a virgin birth? What was it about? this. Okay. Let's keep going. How many of you can repeat the Apostles' Creed? How many of you know the Apostles' Creed? You've seen it? Can you? <laughs> the Apostles' Creed. You, you've been in some, yeah, okay. The Apostles' Creed. Do you agree with all of it? Some of you are going, well, what is it? Would you, would you please put it up, Brenda? Thank you. Here it is. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. Really? The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits. I'm not, I'm not doing that old language, sitteth, okay? I, ah, okay, sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And thence from now on, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen, right? You agree with each and every piece of that? Yes or no? Interesting. 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 359 in their hymnal. Thank you. Why is this important? And where did it come from? Anyone tell me? David, love it. Okay. It was a defense against Arianism, Gnosticism also. Yeah, in particular. And again, we, I've gone through just a little bit about Gnosticism, but that's not my whole point for today. Interesting. You agree with the whole thing. That's what you said. Anyone having second thoughts? 
We okay? You agree with it all? Very important part. You're going, what's he trying to do? Let's keep going, okay? How do you view the physical Jesus? Because part of what we're going to talk about today with a virgin birth is the fact that Jesus was fully divine and fully human at the same time. That's what the virgin birth did for Jesus, fully divine and fully human. But so oftentimes we look at the fully divine, but we don't look at the fully human. Or we just sort of gloss over it and we just think of spiritual things. We, we don't talk or think about physical attributes of Jesus. What do you think Jesus looked like? I did this with the youth a couple of years ago. It was absolutely fascinating what they thought Jesus looked like. Because here's how most people think Jesus, this is what Jesus looks like. The laughing Jesus, sometimes we call it. You know, and if you take a look at the movies, he's six foot two to six foot four with this long flowing hair, oftentimes blue eyes. Are you kidding me? He's Aramaic. National Geographic, several years ago, did a picture of what Jesus would have most likely have looked like. And it's not this. Now, I'm curious to see what picture you guys have picked out. Go ahead. Dark hair, dark eyes, five foot six to five foot seven, not this towering person. Remember, he was nothing to look at. In other words, he didn't have this physical presence about him that people would go, oh, wow. He had a different kind of presence. A man living in the Middle East would not have probably had long hair as we often depict him. How do you see the physical Jesus? I think it's important as we talk about the virgin birth and what it meant, okay? Great picture, by the way. I'm impressed, okay? All right, let's, let's, do, um, let's do the video, if we could, please. Which is it? Which, which do you need to tap into, his humanity or his divinity? How many of you have no issue at all with knowing that Jesus was fully divine? How many of you have no issue at all with understanding that he was fully human? How many of you have no issues at all knowing that he was both at the same time? That is hard for me. I'll be honest, that is very, very difficult for me. Not that I don't believe it. He went through a wonderful, and for me, a scientific argument. And I've told you before, my own coming to Christ. And once I could get my head wrapped around that God created the universe to insert a Y chromosome into Mary, Child's play. Absolute child's play. But what does that child's play mean for all of us? Okay, I need to be quiet. Do you have any comments or questions on what he said? Go ahead. One thing that glared out to me is that Gabriel told Mary that Jesus will reign over the Israel forever. I don't think that happened. Okay. I, I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> okay. It would be, and an answer that I would, <laughs> I couldn't do it. Ron, go ahead. Yeah. 
Everyone hear that? The reality of who Jesus is. And if you really want to go down that whole argument, as everybody has probably in school done the X and the Y chromosome, how males are XY and females are XX, if it's truly X chromosomes are without sin, and it's the Y chromosome that God inserted to make us Jesus without sin, which we're going to talk about if we have time here today. That means Adam's Y chromosome was sinful, so that means anyone with an XY is sinful and with an XX is not, right? <laughs> Knew that a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Which we're also going to talk about. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Yeah, X and Y chromosomes. This, this is fascinating for me. Because I, Ron, I also had not thought about it in those terms, but it makes perfect sense. Mary only carries an X. And how she got it to be without sin, how God caused it to be without sin, not my problem. Okay, he did and inserted that Y chromosome. But what I have a problem with and what I wrestle with is how Jesus wrestled with his humanness. Because it's very easy for me to take a look at Jesus and say, well, of course he didn't sin. He was God. He could just walk around and know, I'm not going to sin here no matter how hard I'm tempted. I'm not going to sin. And been very smug about the whole thing. But what I forget is... And I take the example of Jesus being in the wilderness. And if you read that wonderful account, it says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness when he, before he even began his public ministry, his Spirit drove him into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. And that's when Satan showed up. And it's easy for me to take a look and say, oh, yeah, he was God. So no matter what Satan did, he wasn't going to give in. But I have to tell you, that would have, would have been tough. Physically, not having eaten for 40 days. And then I look at him when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. Do you remember that? When he said, if this is possible, it would be okay if you took this from me as a moment of weakness. Not a moment of sin, but a real moment of weakness. Because perhaps you don't realize, and I don't realize, that Jesus is a human being. Yes, fully God, fully human. Jesus, as a human being, had physical functions just like you and I do. When he sat down with the boys to have dinner, he was at someone's house and the wine was flowing, he was drinking. And what do you think that wine would have done to him? We don't want to think about that because he's Jesus, right? Do you think he didn't get disease? Do you think, because he was Jesus, that if he drank the water, he didn't get stuck from the water? You don't think he needed to cut his hair? You don't, and you can just run down the list. We forget. I forget. He was fully human, and yet he didn't sin. So let's take a look at uh, John. Okay. In the beginning, before all time, was the word Christ. And I'm doing this, I've asked this to be put up with the Amplified Bible. And thank you for putting the amplification in yellow. Excuse me, not yellow, maize. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's not about you, Gary. Okay, here we go. Was the word Christ, and the word was with God, and the word was God himself. He was continually existing in the beginning, co-eternally with God. 
All things were made and came into existence through him. And without him, not even one thing was made that has come into being. Jesus has always been. We do a great job with his divinity. I do. I can see this aspect. I don't understand the three in one, but I can understand this aspect that Jesus is fully God. In him was life and the power to bestow life. As we saw that, as we read about that, and so that's the basis for us being Christian. And the life was the light of men. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it or overpower it or appropriate, appropriate it or absorb it and is unreceptive to it. Keep going. There it was, the true light, the genuine, perfect, steadfast light, which coming into the world enlightens everyone. He, Christ, was in the world and through the world was made through, and though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him, which is all prophecy. He came to that which was his own, that which belonged to him, his world, his creation, his possession. This was his from the beginning. And those who were his own people, the Jewish nation, did not receive and welcome him. But to as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the right, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. That is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name, who were born not of blood, natural conception, nor the will of flesh, physical impulse, nor the will of man, that of a natural father. Take a look at this now. But of God, that is a divine and supernatural birth. They are born of God, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified. Keep going. Keep going, okay? Keep going. I'm running out of time. Because of his humanity, Christ can do what? Because of his humanity, Christ can what? David? He can take on our sin. Do you understand the fact? Only because of his humanity could he take on our sin. And then next, because of his divinity, Christ can, if because of his humanity, he could take on our sins, because of his divinity, he could do what? It's interesting that um, I've got a couple of things that I would like to read to you. Bob, what a wonderful sermon. I had this picked out before your sermon. Some of us are, and this is from Is Christmas Unbelievable by Rebecca McLaughlin. It says, some of us are deeply aware of our sin. Now remember, we just talked about it. Because he was human, he could take on our sin. And because he was divine, okay, some of us are deeply unaware of our sin, even if we don't use that word. We don't like that word. If there is a God who sees our thoughts, our words, and deeds, we know that's not good news for us. Frankly, we find it harder to believe that a God who knew our thoughts would love us enough to want to die for us than to believe that he would diagnose our moral failure. If that's how you feel, good. This, is, this book is not a self-help book to tell you that you are good enough because you're not and neither am I. But time and again in the Gospels, the people who knew they weren't good enough for God were the people who Jesus welcomed. Those seen as too bad to be bothered with or too broken to be fixed were Jesus' preferred company. Wow. 
And when I have a tendency to get smug, when I have a tendency to be condescending, when I have a tendency to be judgmental, I need to remember that Christ died for everybody. And it's not how good I am. Even though he wants us to be good, it's not how good I am and how good you guys are. Because it's not about what we have done. It's about what he has done for us. I have a wonderful video. How many of you know the, the Christian group for King and Country? I just, I just love them because they are edgy. These two brothers from Australia, they are just edgy. And people are coming to them in droves because they are edgy and they hear the word of Christ through them. So if you would put up the video, I'll love it. Oh, I like that group. They're exciting. Yeah. Repent. Repent. Why? Because Jesus was fully human. He could take on our sins. And our sins are many. My sins are many. Because when you consider my thought life, which you have, you <laughs> stay away from my thought life. When I consider my thought life, I understand what a sinful person I am. Repent. Because he was fully human, he could take my sin. And because he was fully divine, forgive it. Die for it. And because he rose from the dead, so will I. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you're both fully divine and fully human. And because of that, it is nothing which we can do or have done or will do. It's all about what you've done for us. Amen.